So welcome to the last lecture of this semester. Uh, today we are joined by Dorothy Bishop, who is a professor of developmental neuropsychology at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, today we will discuss the role of cognitive biases in sustaining bad science. And today's concept is a little bit different. Uh, we have all listened her recorded talk in advance and we are ready to discuss and ask questions. Uh, she was kind enough to accept our invitation and thank you once again and welcome Professor Bishop. Thank you for having me. <laughs> How do you want to uh, organize it? Do you want me uh, to look for questions in the chat or uh, are people going to ask questions more manually or do you want me to provoke questions? So all of them is possible. Uh, mm -hmm. We already uh, received three questions, I believe. Okay. And of course, I have questions as well. <laughs> and um, maybe my colleagues also. Um, yeah, so I maybe can start yeah. with as a maybe, warm up. Yeah. We start yeah. with the questions from the students, huh? Yeah. All right. So, this is a question from Nina, uh, and in your talk, uh, you address pea hacking in the context of garden of forking pets. Yes. Uh, the decisions you delineate, delineate are often done unconsciously mm. or in explorative research. Mm. So what is your professional op opinion to con counteract those deeply rooted biases and would would mandatory rules as to the handling help or how can we, can we as researchers ad address this problem of trying to find meaning, she asks. I don't think we should stop trying to find meaning. <laughs> I think trying to find meaning is, is what science is all about. Um, the real problem is very much when people don't distinguish between uh, hypothesis testing and um, exploratory research. Exploratory research is fine, but what you can't do is use the same data set to both formulate a hypothesis and to test it. And that's where p-hacking is a problem, that people see in the data something interesting, and then they think they can use the same data to test it. And that you simply can't do. So I think partly it's a question of educating people to really understand how that's an important distinction. Um, the second thing I think that really helps is to work with data simulation. I find that people often think that p-hacking is just statisticians being a little bit pedantic. Um, and they only really appreciate how damaging it is and how what a high rate of false positives you can get if you simulate data you simulate random data and then subject it to statistical tests based on what you see in it. And then you start to see that you can get, you know, really sort of 50% rates of P less than 0.05 or so on. Um, also it's, it's partly the garden of forking paths and making those sorts of decisions. There's dividing things into subgroups. There's deciding which subjects to include or exclude. There's lots of different things that are sort of flexible in your data analysis that can mean you're essentially capitalizing on chance. So I think you get a bit inoculated against that if you have explored data where you know there is nothing in that data because you've simulated it to be random. But then you find your statistics look terribly exciting and then you realize, yeah, this is, this is what is the error it's to sort of look for the interesting thing and then try and apply a statistical test having found it. So I, I think that's one solution. I don't think we need terribly formal rules. I think, I, I, have you, I don't know, have you had any sessions on uh, registered reports and pre-registration? Yeah, you're nodding. So, I mean, that is a good way of being clear about the distinction between hypothesis testing and exploration. People often think pre-registration is designed to stop exploratory research, which it's not. It's designed to just make it very clear what is exploratory and what is pre-registered and what is, 
you know, what was anticipated where you are testing an existing hypothesis. So I think um, personally, I try and use registered reports now. It's quite difficult, but I do that a lot in my research. And I think it really keeps you honest. It keeps you aware of where you're, you know, what you did really predict and what you didn't. Uh, but then again, I think for, for training people, um, it's now become increasingly easy to simulate data. And I would thoroughly recommend doing that just to sort of get a more intuitive sense. I think people don't want to do things wrong, but many people really just don't have that intuitive sense of how dangerous p-hacking is. They think it is just, you know, okay, really. So also we saw in uh, uh, one lecture, uh, the dance of p-values yes. uh, from uh, Geoff Cummings' uh, beautiful yes. book. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, that, that's the sort of thing when we've done, I mean, I, on courses, I, I have got, I can give you some links. I mean, I've got some um, course materials where using, even for beginners in, in R, you can sort of show simulated data and where you just find that, you know, you run the same simulation 20 times and the p-values are all over the place. Yeah. And <laughs> some of them will pass the magic 0.05 threshold, even though what you're testing is coming from a population with, with no real difference between groups. Exactly. So I think the question of Vital goes in the same way, right? Maybe I, I read it out to you. Mm -hmm. So Vital found the garden of walking path explanation pretty eye-opening. This made him realize the more factors we include in a statistical calculation, the more likely that one of them will be significant. However, when we are using models, it is normal to try and cover as many variables as possible. Of course, as long as, as power of the study and number of observations allows. So how can one avoid running into this bias? Again, I think it, 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 that is a very good question. And I think the answer has to be to bear in mind this distinction between formulating a model by looking at the data and seeing what looks interesting and testing it and needing to separate the two. So in some, of, some fields, the way to do this is explicitly to sub, if you have a data set and you have enough data to subdivide into one set where, which you'll use to formulate your model and another set then to test it. Uh, but you need a separate sample then to test it. So that, that's one way around that. Um, and yeah, I mean, th I think the other thing is you have to consider, you know, try and have a hypothesis rather than just throwing everything in and trying to see sort of what comes out. I mean, in some fields, that perhaps the best you can do because it's a very, if you're in a very young field, nobody quite knows uh, what are the important variables you may it may be again reasonable to explore but then you shouldn't be using statistical tests on what you get out you should be sort of using your data then to formulate a model which you will then test in another sample yeah it's something um, we do also in, in our field in MR imaging we know okay we have a patient and maybe he stands to lie still uh, 90 minutes in the scanner. In mm. that 90 minute scan time, we squeeze as many mm. sequences as possible. And then uh, we hope that one of them will really um, light up uh, the lesion or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's, it's, it's really normal to do that like that. But then I think it's also important to, to then do the next step to do the replication and reproducibility studies. So you pick up the thing that looks promising, but then you really have to do an extra study and, and try to, yeah, to replicate that result. Yeah. I mean, if, you've, if you're doing a single case study on a patient, that might not be possible because you might not be able to keep you know, bringing them back and testing them. Hmm. The other, other approach is to look for converging evidence and to, I mean, I, I think the other limitation in many fields of science is that we become expert in one method and what is, we go down in our little silo and we're not generalist enough to then try and address, I think we should be thinking about maximally diff, not just replicating exactly the same thing, but also thinking, is there a different way to look at the same question that should give converging evidence? 
in my field where I've tried to do that, it's been really disappointing. So I have, I've spent quite a lot of time interested in auditory explanations for language disorders and dyslexia in children, the idea that they have essential difficulties discriminating perhaps sounds. And there is a big literature on behavioral methods where the child is given tasks to discriminate the sounds, which typically gives some support to the idea that these children are not very good. But then there's another literature using event related potentials where the child is passive and you're just playing sounds and you're looking at the brain differences. And this, you know, it's dreadful because in both literatures, people seem to get a bit of evidence, but the two don't agree at all. So, you know, this is really worrying because you have methods that have different assumptions and, and I mean, one method you're measuring a very automatic response, the other the child's having to attend and memorize and so on. And if these are giving you such different response answers, then I think the time is to, you know, you really have to think hard about whether you're testing what you think you're testing. And the other aspect I found useful is to then think, is there another clinical group I could look at? And again, this is in my more clinically oriented research, but for instance, if I were to look at children who did have trouble hearing, you know, moderate hearing losses, you know, would they have the same sorts of reading problems? So you're, you're always trying to sort of say, we don't just look, attack a question from one methodology, but you should actually look at different methodologies, all of which could answer that question and try to get them, you know, try to see if, if they line up and agree. And I think very often they don't, and it's then quite challenging to our assumptions. So shall we move on to next question? Mm -hmm. So this is also from Rita. So under uh, cognitive constraints, you have mentioned Shemeta uh, need for narrative. Yes. So Rita was wondering if you could elaborate on this. <laughs> and <laughs> is that means uh, we want to have a narrative in our results and by doing so, we are biasing uh, the reporting conclusion of the results. Uh, if so, what would be your recommendation to avoid this uh, kind of bias? I think this is one of the hardest questions that I don't <laughs> know that I have the answer to because we know, I and mean, again, as a psychologist, you know, there's a lot of research on how to make um, texts easy to understand or difficult to understand. And there's no question that narrative structure makes things more interesting, easier to process, easier to remember. And all journal editors will say, you know, you need some narrative in your account when you write up a study. Um, and indeed, some of the most successful people have narratives that, you know, just really good at telling a story about the data and, you know, making it really engaging. And I don't think that's, you know, you, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. The problem is if you, if you focus on that too much, the temptation is extreme to leave out things that don't fit in nicely because it makes a worse narrative. There's no question that if you're writing, you know, if I'm saying, I think I've found auditory problems in these children, and then there's two or three papers that didn't or had data that didn't quite match, you have to go down a little digression and say, well, yes, but there are these other studies and perhaps this is why they don't, you know. It really, you know, makes your, your paper less interesting. And in fact, I've had editors say, well, you just leave that out. But the problem is then we really end up with a, a literature that looks much cleaner than is re really the case. All the inconvenient facts are somehow left out. And we start to, you know, it, it gets worse because you really start to believe uh, every, the, the things that you get this confirmation bias, you have this notion of the story and the things that don't fit it, you actually forget or don't process at all. So I think we have to have a, we have to find a better way of reporting. Now, I know some really sort of rigorous people who are on Twitter and places, they say, you know, we shouldn't have narrative at all. We should just sort of say methods, results, you know, and there's like no attempt to sort of turn this into any kind of story. This would be terrible. I think none of us could process that sort of stuff. You've somehow got, we've got to have ability to synthesize stuff and pull out what is important. 
So I think um, it, it's a really, we're really being pulled very strongly in two directions here. And as scientists, it's up to us to resist the lure of narrative being too strong and to be keep honest, while at the same time trying to, I mean, I think it's a mark of a good scientist that they can sort of synthesize and pull information together. But you have to always worry about the information that you're leaving out. And you need to, I think, sometimes force yourself to consider whether that information uh, you know, needs to be mentioned or you need to somehow deal with it. Because otherwise, uh, I mean, the, this comes down to this phenomenon of so-called harking, hypothesizing after results are known, which everybody tends to do. That you sort of think of your theory after seeing the data and then you pretend that you collected your data to test that theory, although the theory only came from the data. And if you do that, it's not just bad for science, but it, it actually cumulatively is it's very, very bad for junior scientists coming along because one of the points made by the man who wrote the paper on Harking, Norbert Kerr, is he says that it's, it's really weird because you then get a junior person who reads this literature where everything is neat and tidy and tells a nice narrative. They go and do their study and it's a mess. I mean, most of us do research and it's a mess. Nobody can make sense of it. And then they think, well, I must be hopeless at doing science. You know, I'm doing it all wrong. Instead of appreciating that this is really just, everybody is in that situation. So it's, it's sort of quite insidious, the negative effect of, of you know, over-reliance on that narrative. Um, but I don't think there's a simple answer. I'm not saying, I certainly think it would be way too extreme to say, take out all the narrative. I think, you know, that would kill science stone dead. But I, I think we need to have a place and perhaps a special section in papers about, you know, you could have your narrative and then you should have a section on things that actually don't fit. <laughs> you know, things that, um, things I've left out because they don't fit, the theory of anomalism. We, should, we, we need to always be focusing on the things that don't, don't fit in because they're often the most informative. Yeah, but if you include these contradictory uh, papers uh, that don't fit your own results into your narrative, you also create some kind of suspense in your story. So, so to say, the yeah. bad guy comes around the corner <laughs> and he wants to shoot my nice theory. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, so then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the problem is, though, it's not, it's not just the people who want to shoot, but it's the people who are just sort of come up with stuff that is very hard to interpret. You know, it's, it's more often the messiness of scientific data that is the problem, that we want to tell a clean story when the real story it, it is really just, you know, not quite so straightforward. And there's a lot of messy bits and details that aren't quite right. And, and um, it's, it's sort of this tidying up that we mentally do to just somehow drop the stuff that is a little bit not quite right. So I think, uh, I think, but I think it's it's a real problem, and I'm not sure that I have a perfect solution to it, other than again self awareness, um, and perhaps sort of you know if we did have, I mean, a lot of um, papers now encourage authors to have a section at the end saying limitations, which is good, you know, to force you to think, you know, what were the limitations. A lot of authors are nervous about putting things in there because they think the reviewers will then reject the paper if there's anything wrong with it. And again, that's perhaps something that we have to change the way we think about doing reviewing so that we we don't reject things because they fail to provide a perfect story uh, and because they've still got messy bits because everybody's really going to have those and we've got to be more realistic about that yeah up to now we are not used to read papers where things didn't work huh? yeah because of the yeah. publication bias but I think this maybe will will slowly change so that the young uh, young researchers also read about stuff that that did not work and they yeah, get yeah. more used to this messiness. Yeah, huh? yeah. I see we've got some questions in um, in the chat, um, so I'll just look at those. Mentioned that we tend to forget or not check for results not in concordance uh, with negative. Results. How should one search these studies? Yeah, I mean. Um, so studies that don't agree, it, you, the typical way that people proceed to try and find these studies that don't agree is to go and do a, um, a systematic review where you, you know, very formally identify keywords and, and things um, so that you, you 
again, can pre-register exactly how you're going to do this and you're going to search for all these pages. But even that is not a, a, a perfect solution because many negative findings never get published. Or if they do get published, the uh, abstract, which is what you normally search on, may not mention the things that didn't work out. So, uh, you know, I think you have to accept that you're probably always going to be missing some details. There are people now who are starting to say, we could actually do sort of machine searching of entire papers for words, which might help us not lose information that doesn't appear in the abstract because it wasn't, um, you know, it, it wasn't consistent. Um, but again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a perpetual process of losing information that doesn't fit the story. And I think it's led us badly astray and there's growing evidence of a number of sort of quite big theories that persist for 20, 30 years because people only focus on the things that agree and forget about or just don't process the things that disagree. And we are going to have to find a way to minimize that happening in future because it's a huge waste of everybody's resources and time. And it, you know, it can lead you down quite wrong paths things like, you know, interventions and so on. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's another question. Yes. Yes, how can you? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, yeah, Melanie's sort of making a similar point. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I think in the lecture I mentioned that I did literally forget papers that didn't agree with something I was writing for, for um, when I was doing twin studies with language impaired children, I, I, I mean, I was quite shocked at myself because there were these studies I always, when I gave talks, I always cited them and they all agreed with each other and they found a quite strong genetic effect on language disorders. And then I, it was when I was doing a literature review that I thought I better check, is there any new data? And I realized there was this study that had come out that was by somebody who had been a graduate student of mine. I, I wasn't on the paper, but I knew that she as a postdoc had gone on and done this. And I had known it existed, but somehow, you know, mentally, I think my, I just sort of at some deep level thought, well, there must be something wrong with that paper because it doesn't agree. <laughs> and then when I was forced to look at it, I thought, you know, this isn't good enough. I need to explain why this paper gets different results um, or to revise my, my theory. And so the fact that I myself, as somebody who tries to be alert to these things, was quite capable of forgetting something that didn't fit in made me really aware of how readily we do that. I mean, I think it is a very natural cognitive bias that we have to, because it, in everyday life, it works. It, it, it works very well to focus on really just concentrating on the things that agree with, you know, what you know to be true really, and not otherwise you'd get bombarded with too much information. So it's a sort of filtering mechanism that outside science, I think is quite a healthy human characteristic. But science, I think one of the points I wanted to make in my paper on cognitive bias is that scientific thinking forces you to drop what are some very natural and in many contexts adaptive ways of thinking and processing data, which mostly allow shortcuts so that you don't have to process everything, that you, you can just sort of focus on a few things. Um, but so, I think to be a good scientist, you have to really resist those tendencies. But then shouldn't the reviewer who is reviewing your paper, he should see, he or she should see that you are missing a, a, yes. a reference. But uh, yeah, but I think it's also hard for the reviewers. They cannot yeah. know the total no. scope of the literature, right? I mean, I think that's one reason why a peer review, I, I am in in favor of peer review. Peer review gets attacked quite a lot. And I had a person with a lot of expertise in this area the other day I was in an argument with who said they'd never seen any evidence that peer review does any good at all. <laughs> um, I mean, I think peer review is flawed. There's a lot wrong with it, but I think that is one of its purposes is to, you know, it will, it, somebody else may not be on such a narrow track as you. They may have a different perspective and therefore they will think of these other things. Um, and that, that certainly has happened to me that reviewers say, well, you need to consider this, you need to consider that. Um, but they, again, it's not foolproof because um, what tends, uh, there's some very nice demonstrations in the literature. And I, I think I, in the paper I pointed, uh, or perhaps not in the talk you saw, but in the associated paper, I talk about a study by Greenberg where he takes a theory 
some sort of muscular disease, I think it is, where there's a view about what causes it, and, and track through the citations in the literature to show that over time, anything that doesn't agree with the theory is less cited, and things that do agree with the theory are more cited. And so over a few, you know, 10 years or 20 years, if you were to look at that literature, you'd think that everybody agreed with this theory because all the stuff that didn't agree has gradually sort of withered away. And so even, you, you know, your peer reviewers may be unaware that this is not nearly as clear cut as it seemed to be. So there's this, this is the, the bad thing is it's not just the one off studies, it's the way you then accumulate across studies uh, to get what this, um, you know, this, this sort of um, Bergstrom and his colleagues have talked canonization of false facts, you know, this, this belief in theories and ideas that actually don't have much empirical support or, or far less support than you might think. Yeah, so, so maybe it's way, also a uh, sorry to uh, go ahead. Uh, Manuela exactly asked uh, what I would like to ask actually. And uh, I also try to find um, an answer in the internet uh, if you can, for example, search through the text. Mm. And if it is possible, for example, with the recent natural language processing methods mm. like uh, artificial intelligence mm. algorithms. And I found a uh, uh, literature uh, and I would like to just share it mm -hmm. with you. And uh, so it looks like it is possible to do that. I mm. Mean, uh, mm. So uh, maybe with okay. the help of uh, artificial intelligence, we uh, might not uh, overlook the negative results anymore. I mean, people have already been doing these um, sc uh, screens of, uh, entire literatures automatically with machine learning uh, to look at things like, there've been studies looking at the re reporting of statistics and p-values less than 0.05 and things. Yeah. Um, and there was another that it's also been used to look at things like, you know, um, oh, that's more to looking at titles and abstracts and things, but you know, whether there's imbalance in gender and so on. So that, that it is poss perfectly possible to um, upload now that, articles are all online, you know, you can upload them and you can do um, machine based searches of various kinds. It's, it's never going to be perfect. But if you wanted to look for keywords of a particular kind, you should be able to pull up articles that include those in the in the body of the text, even if it's not in the abstract. It's just very, very labor intensive um, to, to do that. And um, it would be nice if you didn't have to. It's another Same. question about citation bias. There's a statement or hypothesis in a paper with only one reference, and there seems to be a high chance of missing studies with results proving this statement to be incorrect. What should I take care of it if I want to cite this hypothesis in one of my own papers? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think if you want to cite a hypothesis in one of your own papers, you, you should really be looking more broadly, you should never just rely on somebody else's introduction or, you know, reportage of, of that hypothesis. You should do a little bit more diligence in looking around in the literature for other studies that are relevant to that. Um, I, I guess that's, that's all I can say. Again, I think I, I mentioned in the talk, um, you know, this, these sort of examples of uh, the cerebellum in autism where, you read, it's, this is a really interesting one because if you read the animal literature where people are doing genetic modification and so on, the introductions of most of those papers are written as if it's an established fact that the cerebellum is highly important in autism. If you read the human literature, that is far from being accepted. So these literatures actually diverged at some point. It's almost like you, an evolutionary process. You can follow the sort of pattern of citations. Um, and everybody was just really citing the literature from their own subfield. And so you get this impression growing in one literature that this is a strong effect. Um, and then in the other literature, much more controversial. And that's where you've actually got humans with autism and the brain scans and so on. Evidence much, looks much less good. Um, so what you really should do if you were, I think in that literature, I would feel if I was working on the mouse model of the cerebellum, 
rather than just sort of looking at all the other papers on the mouse model of the cerebellum, one might want to sort of go and back and look or jump over and say, you know, how much evidence these days is there for this in humans? And you might be quite shocked to find how controversial that is in humans and how a lot of people don't think the cerebellum is particularly implicated. But this is just, it's grown into becoming a sort of encapsulated theory and people are not reading broadly enough outside their area. So I guess that is the other thing that we, we everybody has information overload. We all have far too much to process in the way of papers and things, but to sometimes step out of your own area is really good. And I found, I mean, I, I work in an area that spans a lot of different areas and that makes it even harder but sometimes it's really useful to do that. And for me, for example, to go to a genetics conference, I'm interested in genetics, but I'm not a geneticist. You get a very different perspective on genetics of language disorders than if you just sit in with the people that work on genetics of language disorders, you get a broader look at genetics. Or if I go and talk to linguists or, you know, just sort of people who are working in a related field can be a very useful experience to attend a conference uh, that's a little bit outside your comfort zone and just see how people talk about some of the constructs that you are interested in. Hmm. Got another one. Should something fundamentally change in the way we write papers? How can reporting and reading negative results be made more appealing or get more accepted? Yes. Yeah, that's a, it's really hard. Um, there is, I mean, I think things are beginning to change already with um, the much greater use of preprints. Um, and it, this is one place where you might want to deposit some results, which uh, you, you don't want to spend the time battling with reviewers and getting it into a journal, but you nevertheless feel it's a good study, properly done, it should be out there. And that is a way of, of you know, I think that is beginning to address the imbalance. Um, again, registered reports is very good because there the paper is simply evaluated in terms of whether you've asked a sensible question and uh, addressed it with appropriate methodology and it's accepted if that's the case. So the negative result will get into the literature. Um, so I think, I think that is beginning to change. Um, but more generally, I, I'm moving increasingly in favor of thinking we need sort of more of these studies that do address the same question from different angles, which involves more collaboration between people, perhaps the, the pressures at the moment on people to have lots of papers on their CV is, is I think quite a negative force here, because it means that rather than, you know, maybe two or three people with a common interest, each tackling the que same question from a different angle and then coming together to sort of put it all together, that would, to my mind, be a better way of proceeding um, and might allow a mixture of negative and positive results to then be really informative uh, as to what this all means. That would depend though more on changing the incentive structure so that that was not career suicide. And also, you know, maybe the funders would be more willing to do that. I, I have a comment uh, that uh, goes in the general area also tying back to, to what you said before about uh, the narrative that, uh, that we give in our papers and uh, up to now Santos that asked uh, uh, that we, if we should fundamentally ch change the way we write papers. I think that uh, all this course that we had this semester was going in, in this way and I think in a way open science might be uh, in, in general, an answer to this question. Um, uh, to explain myself, I had uh, someone who told me uh, once, I don't remember unfortunately who, uh, they were coming from a uh, computer science background and they were saying, your pap the paper that you produce is not your work. Uh, the paper is the advertising of your work. Your work is, uh, mm. in, in their case, was the code that you produce, mm -hmm. but it can be the data that you produce. Mm. And, and, and I think... Uh, that the whole concept of open science, publishing the data, publishing the, the code is uh, uh, helping probably change. And do you, do you think that this could be a, a, a way to go? So uh, the paper is a companion to the actual work that we yeah. then release to the public. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think I think that was um, I think Philip Stark might be some. He, he's actually written a paper where he does sort of talk about you know the paper being advert. He's saying if if you don't also have your data in your code it's just an advertisement and that's not good enough and I, I feel increasingly the same I mean um, and in my own work now I'm always trying to make everything available so um, I mean every, the emphasis has been on open data but I actually feel open code is if anything at least as important because it, it shows you how people got from the data to their conclusions um, and even with, you know, you, you can simulate like data, again, you can have fictitious data, but you just need that path from how did you, how did you draw those conclusions? And you pick up a huge number of errors if you do that as well. I mean, that's the other sad thing about the literature is not just that it's distorted, but that it's full of errors because people have been nervous of making it open. And partly because they think if it's open, people will find errors. Well, believe me, you will, because I find errors, you know, in my own stuff. And I try and be really, really careful. And there have been some very good um, instances of people sort of coming clean and, um, you know, confessing, if you like, to their to their own errors in their paper and make, making it more normative and more acceptable to do that. But that's one of the things that will happen if people are more open about data and code. We will realize that there's often uh, errors in there as well as, um, you know, biases in terms of what gets reported. But I, I absolutely agree that I see, I mean, I get to the point now where if I'm asked to review a paper, I'm very reluctant unless I can see the data in the code because I feel I can't properly evaluate it. But that's a huge change. Um, and I mean, how a very rapid change. So I was asked quite recently for somebody who's doing a meta-analysis for some of my old data. Um, and I was pleased, I said, oh, it's on Open Science Framework. Mm -hmm. But actually it was in a terrible state on Open Science Framework. It, it was not well documented. Um, you know, we didn't have a proper data dictionary explaining what everything was. And I, when I looked at it, I was quite shocked. I thought, oh, I've come a very long way. I, I, you know, but that's just in, you know, perhaps the past 10 years. Um, but I, I think that, that there's a really sort of strong movement in that direction and that will make a big difference if we are more open. Um, somebody is also saying, what leads people to unconsciously faulty reasoning? Why do scientists unconsciously tend to confirmation bias and mentally suppress? I think it's just humans. I mean, I think it's, it's how our brains are set up. Again, it's just like I've said before, I think in many contexts in life, this is a really useful way to think. Um, and to discuss, I mean, if you think about it, um, it's almost that we are Bayesians. We are, you know, we go through life with prior expectations. Um, and if we have a strong prior expectation, it takes a lot of negative evidence to overturn it. And that's, that's sensible really. Um, you know, so if somebody comes along and claims to be able to cure COVID with, you know, drinking lemon juice or something, you know, I'm not going to believe them uh, because my prior is that this is not a science, sensible scientific view and so on. Um, so if you have formed a theory that you're very fond of, you become quite resistant because you, you, you sort of suck in everything that will agree with that theory and you, and you resist things that don't. And I think that in most situations in life, as I said before, you know, scientific reasoning is not natural. It's, it's that... Uh, in most situations in life, though, you, you tend to, you know, go very much with your expectations as well as with all the evidence that you're seeing from the world around you, just so that you're not overwhelmed. I've got another question. You haven't talked about it in the presentation. You mentioned it briefly in the beginning. Systematic misunderstanding of prob probability, yes. Um, the problem in particular becomes very small when people are better trained in statistics but it's still a probability theory. It's often a very unintuitive thing to grasp. What do you think from a psychological point of view, to what extent is a feeling for probability learnable? Ha! Huh. Um, I still find probability really hard. Um, you know, and I, I, I find the only, I got a much better grip on it when I did start doing simulations and I could just test things out. Um, I still find now that I make statements about probability and I will check them by going back and simulating some data and making sure that I have actually got that right. So I don't know how far it's learnable. Um, we do, we, we have got a sort of project that we have had in the background in my group for two or three years now, which we've never got round to finishing because we've got other things to do, but I want to finish, which is to see whether exactly that, whether we can train people to at least 
um, overcome that one of the big problems is, is failure to understand um, sample size and how it affects you know how, how small samples of it can be very misleading and that is one of the things that makes people do underpowered studies they really don't realize just how um, unlikely it may be to see the, the a result that's really there if you've got a small sample and so we, we do have this idea that we wanted to try training people by having a little game where they just sort of see a sample on the screen a data set and then they have to say whether they think it comes from one distribution where there's a no real effect or distribution where there is an effect but of a moderate size and then sort of see whether they can learn how sample size actually is important in making that prediction accurate so uh, it's a question I'd, I'd love to be able to sort of show that you could improve people's ability to reason on these things but it does seem that it's not intuitive and one of the all the really old old work by Danny Kahneman, who was one of the people that really picked up on this early on, he would give lectures where he would be addressing mathematicians and statisticians and he'd put up one of his little problems and they would all get it wrong. So I think it's really hard to be intuitive about probability. <laughs> So uh, probably you know about Daniel Lekens. Yes, he, yes. Yeah, he has a course uh, also about statistic, improving statistical inference. Yes. And I recently learned also he made a, I mean, uh, throughout the course, uh, you need to take some tests uh, and yep. you need to fill out the forms. Uh, but it went and now they also publish it uh, it, that's statistical intuition also trainable and it uh -huh. gets better with the training and right. uh, maybe yeah. it can support uh, yeah i'll have to look at that evidence because, yeah yeah i, mean, I can't his remember course is the, great yeah, his, yeah his, the, the course is great yeah exactly i was going to tell also about uh, this uh, open science um osf page and he's also teaching how to prepare an osf page Yes, and how to make it really tidy yeah. in order yes. to make it uh, available for everyone. He he has been he's been superb, and he's he's now got another one improving your statistical questions. Which, yeah, um, it, and he says he learned really from the first course. He he thinks the second course is perhaps better because he learned what people really needed to know, and he, he so he's modifying his views. But no, I think he's, I, I, I really strongly recommend things that uh, he does. And I, he's very good at, at explaining things. Um, uh, he's also quite um, combative. He, he, you know, he's a good man to get in an argument with, uh, it, but he, he uh, I, I, I find it refreshing having uh, discussions <laughs> with him we don't we normally do agree actually i i find that he and i uh, typically are in the same place but where you don't agree he's also he's, he's sort of great fun to to argue with because he thinks about things in a slightly different way to the way you're typically taught to think about them and i think that's what's so you know, nice and refreshing about him so yes i can i can only agree and but if he says it's teachable well i hope he's right um <laughs> I, I definitely feel I have I have got a better understanding and only really in recent years I don't think I had I, I think I I've been doing research now for 40 odd years 45 years probably and I think I did it for the like the first 30 odd years without really much understanding of what I was doing it was much more formulaic and it was much more that you know I knew how to run the statistical tests. I had some sense that there were assumptions that you made but I don't think I had such an understanding of quite what it meant to get this result or that result um, and it mainly came about from simulating data and sometimes I was really surprised with something that came out of a simulation I thought I must have simulated it wrong and this was very much the case with some of the early stuff um i mean i did this blog post because i had been simulating results from analysis of variance which i think people don't use quite so much now but it used to be the the thing everybody did certainly in event related potential work and in um, a lot of psychology and i had just found that i kept getting too many significant results when i had complex designs with three-way four-way analysis of variance and when you simulate it you realize it's because you actually should be correcting for the number of contrasts you're doing, but nobody who teaches analysis of variance tells you that. Um, and so 
it was essential. It's like p hacking. It's just sort of like too many things that you're looking at. If you don't have clear predictions about which things you're interested in, and you just look at everything and all the interactions and all the individual factors, you can very quickly get into a situation where there's a high chance of finding spurious results. But no, you know, and other people um, who, when I when they read that, they they said they were quite shocked that. You know, we, we had none, nobody had ever taught any of us this, and it's not in any of the, of the textbooks. And I, I just assumed I was wrong for a long time. Uh, and then gradually I found, yes, this did seem to be the case, that yeah. this was a, a flaw in how Anniverse taught. Any more questions from our students? Um, if this will be our uh, last uh, meeting for this semester, so mm -hmm. uh, it's wonderful that we can have you as uh, our last uh, guest. And uh, um, do you do you have some pearl of wisdom that you would like <laughs> to share with? Uh, with our students, like uh, if you don't, uh, if you forget everything about uh, this whole semester, please remember this. <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. I, I think just um, it, it sort of sounds corny, but you know, I think you know, follow your instincts to do the right thing. To do you, you, you probably came into science in order to do good science, and because you were in, you were fascinated and perhaps a bit nerdy, and because you. Um, maybe want, you know, had some motive of wanting to better humanity or something. And I get very depressed at how often when I'm talking to early career people, they say, well, this is all very well in theory, but if I do that, then my career will never take off. I'll be damaged. I won't get publications, you know, et cetera. And people are very, you know, I think it disturbs me that people have been trained very rapidly by people of my generation to become quite cynical and to see this as a game that you have to play and that you have to do certain things that you know are not quite right, but in otherwise, you know, if you don't play the game, you're in trouble. And then if I say, well, you, that's a bad idea, <laughs> you should do things properly, they then turn and say, well, it's all right for you, you know, you've done well, you're famous, you've done, uh, but what about me? I'm unknown. But I, I, you know, obviously I don't want to blight people's careers, but I, I think I basically have a really optimistic message, which is I think things are changing. I think um, the reason that things are changing is that the funders in particular, the people who fund research have begun to get very aware of all of these problems and very concerned about them. Because if you're a funder and you're giving out very large sums of money for research to be done, the last thing you want is for that to be wasted on research which is pointless or even worse misleading and so certainly in the UK and I think in other countries as well the funding bodies are more and more getting focused on integrity good science reproducibility open science and these are things that are going to start being evaluated and so if you start doing things that way I think there is a period where there's still many of my generation or even the generation below mine who have done things the old way and may still continue to put pressure on people to do things that way. But I, I genuinely think we are in a good place at the moment where things are starting to change and that early career researchers can make a big change. Often older people don't really do things themselves, not necessarily because they are um, hostile but because they don't know how to do it they feel you know a bit lost with all this new approaches and they, they probably are embarrassed that they don't understand the statistics and stuff which you know mostly haven't been taught but I think um, you know so I think the future is young people and that it's very important that we break away from this idea that you know the only people that are going to be left behind in the field are the ones that get cynical and say, well, I'll, I'll just do it all wrong. I don't care. I've got to pay the mortgage. Um, we, we do need idealistic people who want to do good science. Um, you know, and, and I think that there are enough of them that it's really things are going to change and that maybe in 20 years time, we'll look back and think, 
how on earth did we allow this situation to go on for so long with people doing p-hacking and all this stuff and just generating this big literature, which is not very useful. So I think that's, I've said my piece. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. And uh, I, I probably also passed a little bit my uh, early career researcher phase, uh, uh, but I still uh, feel very strongly about the ethics of what I do and I do it uh, for an idealistic purpose. And I hope that uh, also our students and uh, uh, early researchers uh, are not here for the money because they would be probably uh, misled. Uh, there is, I don't think there is much money to be done for ourselves <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the career path that we, show, that we choose. So we might, uh, if we cannot get rich, at least we should do the right thing and uh, try to uphold our principles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tuba, would you like to do some closing? Oh yeah. I think it was a great discussion and we learned a lot and it was really thought prov provoking. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, and uh, I guess we're probably all going to have a bit of a break for uh, the holiday season. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We in the UK take a long holiday at this time of year and we all feel we need it before the dreaded Brexit strikes. <laughs> I hope uh, after uh, vaccination. Yeah, well, heaven knows. But um, no, it's been, it's been very... It's one of the more pleasant things about having been in this funny year is that the number of you know groups that are growing uh, that are really interested in discussing these matters and are very interested in cleaning up science and so uh, it's it's been real pleasure meeting with you people and thank you for inviting me thank you very much right, thank, thank you for being with us